1934, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, US economist Simon Kuznets developed the concept of measuring the nation's economy, gross domestic product. Initially used by nation states to inform policies and identify expenditure choices, over the decades GDP has evolved into a key measure of the performance of our national economies. Fast forward 80 years to a period where according to the OECD, the massive increase in the consumption of materials and energy is now driving the depletion of the world's natural capital at scales that in many cases risks irreversible change that could endanger two centuries of living standards. The production of GDP is dependent on three things. Firstly, it requires a common unit of measure of economic activity. They're, the, they're our financial currencies. It also requires a system of accounts for recording economic transactions, our national accounts. And thirdly, it requires the practical ability to collect this information across the entire economy. In 2008, a group of experts in science, economics and statistics applied an analogous conceptual framework to design a, what we hope to be a practical and robust method to measure changes in the biophysical condition of the nation's environmental assets. This accounting for nature method is designed to provide a practical and affordable way of building environmental accounts that describe the condition of any environmental asset, native vegetation, soil, rivers, etc., at any scale. We've given the common measure a name. It's called an ECOND, which is short for Environmental Condition Index, where 100 describes an asset in an undergraded state. Now, the ECOND is a simple idea. It is, after all, just an index. Yet it is, one, it is one whose design has confounded the experts for decades. Our mistake in hindsight has been, instead of agreeing on a framework and allowing it to evolve over time, i.e. how GDP evolved, we have argued over the detail, demanding too much perfection, and in the process we have let perfection become the enemy of the good. Just imagine a world without national accounts. We wouldn't know if the economy is growing or stagnating. We wouldn't know whether to borrow or save. We wouldn't know if inflation was high or low. We wouldn't know if our current account was rising or falling. We wouldn't even have known we were having a global financial crisis, let alone the tools by which to manage it. Yet this is still how we manage the environment. A few indicators here, usually measured so infrequently and so inconsistently, we can rarely identify whether the assets are degrading over time, or whether our investments to protect them are actually having any effect. Over the past five years, Australia's regional NRM authorities, in cooperation with some of Australia's leading scientists, economists and statisticians in both universities, CSIRO, Bureau of Meteorology and other Commonwealth and state agencies, we conducted a five-year continental-wide trial to test the practical application of this accounting for nature model. The trial was conducted across 10 geographically diverse regions. These regions do reflect different landscapes, they are subject to different environmental pressures, they have different levels of resourcing, and they have different access to information. This trial involved literally hundreds of experts volunteering their time and expertise. And it is important for two reasons. Firstly, it has demonstrated the utility of a common unit of measure to enable scientific information to be placed in an accounting framework. And secondly, it has shown for a modest financial investment, it actually is feasible to measure the condition of the nation's environmental assets every year with a precision that is to inform policy and investment decisions. The results, which are in this War and Peace have been reviewed by some of Australia's most distinguished natural resource scientists. You probably know many of them and you probably know why I now have grey hair. It also has the support of the 56 regional NRM bodies across Australia. And I hope that will become obvious why they have such strong support of it. But it also has endorsement of Dr Ken Henry, 
the former Treasury Secretary and now Chair of the National Australia Bank, and it also has the, former, the support of the former Deputy Australian Statistician, Mr Peter Harper, and it was Peter who actually chaired the United Nations process which developed an international system of environmental economic accounts in 2012. For those of you who are interested in, because you won't get much detail today, we have published a revised accounting for nature methodology and based on the experience of this trial, and that's available on our website. So late in 2016, we, NRM Regents Australia and the Australian Bureau of Statistics, had the privilege of making a joint presentation to a meeting of Commonwealth State and Territory Environment Ministers in Sydney. These ministers have now agreed to work together to develop, for the first time, a common national approach to environmental accounts in this calendar year. What I'd like to do in this presentation is to briefly take you through the core elements of this methodology. The policy context, in other words, why do we need to do this? The method that was developed from the practical experience from the trial? And thirdly, how these environmental accounts can then be used to inform policy and investment decisions. So firstly, the policy context. A sustainable society, as Lee has just said, is one that creates wealth without degrading its natural capital. Very simple concept. However, if we are to make this transition, we need to be able to measure the quantity of natural resources to define how effectively they are being used and how economic activity is affecting the stock of those resources. That's efficiency measures. We must also be able to measure the impact human activity is having on the condition of those assets. As I mentioned, the United Nations Statistical Commission took up this challenge several years ago, and in 2012, it formally adopted an international system of environmental economic accounts, what we refer to as the SEA. The ABS now uses this standard to produce environmental economic accounts to show changes in the efficiency and resource use for some of Australia's major natural resources. But one aspect of the SEA that has remained unresolved is the measurement of environmental degradation. While the science base to produce such information exists, no nation anywhere in the world has been able to develop a practical and cost-effective method for compiling such information at scales that can be then used to actually inform decisions. So let me turn to the, the method just briefly for you. Accounting for Nature addresses these challenges by combining the science of reference condition benchmarking with a range of scientifically accredited sampling methods to describe the common unit of measure, what, as I said, we call an ECOND. As I said, the, an ECOND describes the condition of any environmental asset, be it a river, soil, native vegetation, fauna, estuaries, whatever, at any scale. As an index between 0 and 100, where 100 is a measure of the asset in an undegraded state. This index simplifies complex information to enable land managers, policy makers, and the broader community to make more informed choices. It also enables the same information to be used to identify the pressures that are driving the change, to evaluate the cost-effective actions to manage those pressures, and then monitor the success of those investments over time. Environmental asset condition accounts contain four levels of information. We have the summary tables, the one on the left, which show the econ scores for all the assets in a particular location in each year. The middle table are the asset tables themselves, which show the indicators used to construct the econs. And thirdly, we have the data tables, which store the data used to calculate the indicators. It is from these tables that we are then able to construct nature's balance sheet. And there you have it. The balance sheet describes the changes in the condition of each asset between accounting periods. This figure is an example of the changes in the condition of two river assets in southeast Queensland in 2010 and 2011. It shows the condition of the Noosa River, for example, improved by 5% that year, whereas the Brisbane River declined by 9% over the same accounting period. The balance sheet also highlights which indicators most contribute to the change, and I'll come back to that in a second. 
So in order to describe the complexity of an environmental asset, several indicators often need to be integrated to describe the condition of that asset for a particular location. We developed a seven-step method for constructing these accounts uh, to produce such measures. The figure in, to the right shows how each of these steps contribute to the assembly of an account, in this case for native vegetation asset in the Air Peninsula region of South Australia. And you find all this written up in, uh, in the paper that's on our website. So you don't have to look at the detail. Each account then is accredited by an appropriate scientific body against a set of agreed standards so that everyone knows uh, that, the, uh, that the figures are reliable and robust. These national standards ensure that the choice of indicators, the method of combining the indicators, the frequency of data collection and the selection of the reference benchmark produce a measure of condition of sufficient quality to inform an investment decision. Data quality is likely to vary considerably for different assets across different regions. The national standards therefore also assign a quality assurance rating to indicate to the users how well data meets a particular standard. Ratings range from 0 to 5 and you need to get a rating of 1 which would describe the minimum standard required to inform those decisions. <coughs> I'd now like to show you a couple of examples from the National Trial to, de to demonstrate how these accounts can be used to guide management and de investment decisions. Firstly, by simplifying complex scientific information, and secondly, by identifying cost-effective actions to manage those pressures. Simplifying complexity is not a, just a neat idea for marketing and communications it is actually fundamental to good policy making because it enables non-experts to make informed choices and trade-offs that better match their preferences. Dealing with unwanted complexity is one of the five dimensions the Australian Treasury uses to underpin its analysis of public policy issues from a whole of economy and whole of society perspective. So let me give you a couple of examples. The figure on the left shows the condition of native vegetation across six geographically and biologically distinctive regions across Australia. Each region has used different indicators to measure the condition of that asset that are relevant to their landscapes. The figure on the right displays the relative condition of six distinctly different environmental assets in the southeast Queensland region. The population of dugongs in Moreton Bay, the native vegetation, wetlands, estuaries, and they are all described on one graph. This shows, I hope, the importance of a headline index in simplifying complexity. The y-axis in every one of these examples is exactly the same, where 100 describes an asset in an undergraded condition and when naught and naught when an asset no longer exists. This figure shows the next level of detail. Each bar represents the condition of individual vegetation types in three distinctly different regions across Australia. As you'll see below each of those bar charts, uh, this data can also be spatially referenced. The accounts hold even more detail. One of the indicators of native vegetation condition in the Air Peninsula is weeds. This figure uses this data in the accounts to show where in the landscape weeds are having the greatest impact on the condition of that asset. The darker the colour, the greater the impact. Let's use another example, soil. This figure describes the condition of soil across the Queensland Murray-Darling Basin region. The high scores, the dark colours, show soils in better condition than the low scores. The same accounting information can produce this information. It shows where erosion, that is the blue colour, is the main driver of soil degradation in the upper catchments and how the loss of soil carbon yellow is driving the loss of condition in the central cropping areas of that region. And this figure just demonstrates that even with limited data, as we do have with, with soils, scientists are able to estimate the rate of erosion that has occurred in that landscape since European settlement. 
Don't ask me how they did that. It's in the technical report, but it was clever bunnies in CSIRO who put that together. And to emphasise once again the importance of the Econ Headline Index in simplifying complexity, the y-axis in every one of these examples is exactly the same. 100 is an asset in an undergraded state, and naught is recorded when that asset no longer exists. But of course, effective policy and investment decisions are not made simply on the basis of headline indicators. They rely on the ability to use data to identify the cause of the problem and determine how and where to direct investments to address them. This is where long-term data trend is vital to decision making. The South East Queensland Environmental Account on the left shows changes in the condition of each of its 13 river systems across the region. Each year, the region releases an annual South East Queensland's Healthy Waterways report card on the changes to the river systems. That's the figure to the right. This report card co converts the scientific information in the account into what they call ecosystem health grades, A, B, C and F, to describe the level to which each of the 13 catchments in the region is meeting the, the state's water quality objectives. A river receives an ecosystem health rating of A when it has an econ over 90, because that means that the water is safe to drink, for people to swim, it provides habitat for threatened species, and it is not polluting the downstream estuary. A B rating, which requires an econ between 55 and 90, means that guidelines have been met for most of the reporting area. And an F is where an econ is below 25, and that indicates that the river system is failing those environmental standards. Now, South East Queensland used this long-term trend data in the environmental account to model the likely pollutant loads from increased urbanisation on these assets in the future. That's the figure to the top left. The analysis found that increased nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment are likely to be the primary contributors to the decline in the condition of the region's freshwater assets. That's the figure to the bottom left. A regional green infrastructure investment plan was then produced which evaluated the most cost effective actions to address those pressures and in doing so achieve the region's goal of maintaining the condition of these assets. The figure on the right shows how this analysis is combined with geospatial information to identify locations in the catchments where uh, investments can be best directed to achieve those outcomes. They're the uh, areas marked in red. Now, if government followed this advice, investments such as restoring native vegetation along riparian corridors can cater for an additional one million people moving into this region and still maintain the Moreton Bay at a target condition B for a total annual cost of $25 million. That's less than $10 per rate payer per year, less than 1% of the region's infrastructure budget. So in conclusion, the SEQ Healthy Waterways Program is without doubt the world's best practice in environmental monitoring. It proves that science is capable of producing such information. The breakthrough with the Accounting for Nature trial is not a new scientific method. The breakthrough is the design of a practical and affordable system for monitoring all the nation's environmental assets every year at a, at a precision sufficient to inform landscape scale policy and investment decisions. We are obviously therefore delighted with the response from the nation's environment ministers who have now agreed to work together to develop a common national approach to environmental accounts in 2017. We are also, what is also delighting us is that having seen the practical benefits of this method is the enthusiasm we are now receiving from the private sector and land conservation agencies for their business planning. So here's the vision. Every region, every year, measures and reports on the condition of its major environmental assets. That's the first step. The cost, we estimate that with the right institutional model in place, an additional $15 million per annum for the entire continent. And we believe that by adopting a business-like approach, such a system can be in place with, across Australia within five years. Once that's in place, the next step is to help land managers in the private sector produce affordable asset condition accounts to help inform their business decisions. On that, we are hold, uh, planning holding a series of workshops 
across Australia in the second half of this year. If you are interested in attending, you are most welcome. Simply contact us or your regional NRM body. So as I said, just imagine the innovation such an accounting framework will unleash once it is in place. It will, we believe, fundamentally transform the way we understand and manage the Australian landscape. Thank you very much for your time.